Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, Lord, I ask uh, this morning that you would please be with me as I speak, um, that it not be my words, and that it be your words that I speak. Father, you know how deceptive the devil is. You know how uh, we have all been sleeping so soundly. Um, I pray, Father, that um, you would speak through me to make things clear, um, to make things understandable, Father, and, and Lord, help draw away the veil somewhat so that we can see what is actually happening um, and, and help us to awaken uh, from our slumber, Lord. Please be with me. Please, please help me to speak your words. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to just uh, jump right into the word. After I get my notes. <laughs> um, the first part of this uh, message and this presentation is actually going to be quite a bit of review, hopefully, for most of you. Um, these are things that Seventh-day Adventists have known for a long time, and um, until recently, we used to preach a lot more. <laughs> um, but I think this topic is especially important now, and so I'm going to spend some time reviewing in the beginning, and then in the second half, um, hopefully there will be things um, that uh, we can all learn. So if you would take your Bibles and if you would turn to Revelation chapter 13, um, that's where we will be spending the entire time in uh, Revelation chapter 13. The title for the presentation this morning is The Lamb Like and as a review, as Seventh-day Adventists, who, what do we know the lamb-like beast to represent? The United, States. United States of America, right? This is the one place in the scriptures that we believe that there is a direct prophetic reference to the United States. And so we'll start in verse 11. And Andy doesn't have to read this because he already memorized it. <laughs> Um, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So why do we think, or how do we know, I should say, that the lamb-like beast here represents the United States? Well, there are certain features, certain characteristics that distinguish this from the other beasts and the other symbols and prophecy, isn't there? If you look in the first half of the... Uh, of Revelation 13, and I'm not going to review all of that, simply because we have to have a limit as to how much we review. But the first, there's actually the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13:11 is actually the second beast in the chapter of Revelation 13. What was the first beast that came out? The one that came out of the sea. The one that came out of the sea, right? And uh, that first beast rises out of the sea, has seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, it's not the subject of today's study, but as most of you have had some background in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what does this first beast represent? Papal Rome, Roman Catholic system. Right? Papal Rome. Now, in Revelation 13, verse 11, this beast, this lamb-like beast, is in contrast to the first beast. Where does this beast come from? Earth. 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 It comes out of the land. Now, in Revelation 17, 15, it says, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so we know that the first beast came out of the seas, the waters. And so this first beast representing 
a empire or a, a power, world power, came from a populated region, right? And so it, that papal Rome grew out of Europe, right? In contrast to that, the second beast grew out of the earth, okay? And it grew out of a place which was relatively sparsely populated. Now there's a lot of papers coming out these days saying there were people here before, there were smaller cities here before. But in comparison to Europe, the United States grew up in a land that was fairly um, unpopulated, right? So, the beast coming up out of the earth. It had a two horns, like a lamb. Now what do these two horns represent? Young. Young, okay. That's actually excellent. So, we're going to talk about the two horns like a lamb. And I think what we need to do is we need to go back in American history. And so we're going to do some reviewing. When you were children, <laughs> uh, and I am getting to learn to review this sooner because of my children. <clears throat> when you learned about American history and the first in the beginnings of the United States, what were the two colonies, I should ask, that you first learn about? Do you remember? So Plymouth and Jamestown, right? So Jamestown was established in 1619. It's the first representative assembly in America. The reason why we uh, learn about Jamestown is in, in part because of this reason. Uh, it convened, uh, or I'm sorry, the, in 1619, the first representative assembly in America, the General Assembly, convened in, James, in the Jamestown Church to establish one equal and uniform government over all of Virginia, which would provide just laws for the happy guiding and governing of the people there inhabiting. So we, we learn about Jamestown, and Jamestown was formed by individuals who came to the New World for what reason? Somewhat freedom. Persecution. But actually, Jamestown is many times uh, held up in contrast to Plymouth. Now, the people who came to Plymouth came for what reason? Spiritual. Religious freedom, right? Plymouth is, is, is especially important because it, ha it helps to establish our ideal of religious freedom. They came fleeing of the religious freedom of England, and they wanted to do that. They first went to Holland, but when they realized their children be were becoming absorbed into the Dutch culture, they decided they wanted to live in a new world where they could be free, but also preserve their culture, right? In contrast, the men of Jamestown were actually men of economic opportunity. Right? They came because they were seeking to gain money. Well, okay. They didn't come necessarily for some sort of religious ideal. They came because of of uh, their, their wow. men of men of fortune, <laughs> right? Okay. Now these two these two towns represent something really important about our, nation, about our nation. And we are told in, a, in the spirit of prophecy that the pillars of our nation are what are they? Republicanism and Protestantism. Now when we say Republicanism are we talking about the Republican party? No, we're not talking about the political party, the Republican Party. What we say when we say republicanism is that we are a republic nation, a, a, a republic. Our nation is a republic, an independent republic. And what that means is, is that we are a nation without an earthly king. Right? Abraham Lincoln understood this. In 1863, he said, what? In the Gettysburg Address, 
that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, should not perish. Right? You know, something that's little known is that Abraham Lincoln was actually quoting John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, in the prologue to that Bible translation, for which he is famous, in kicking off the Protestant Reformation, wrote, the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And actually, Abraham Lincoln was quoting that. This is, in fact, a biblical principle. The second pillar was Protestantism. And I realize that now the definition of what Protestantism is has been changing. And so perhaps people don't understand what Protestantism is, and so we were going to we're going to say this. Protestantism, in summary, is a church without a pope. Okay? Um, in essence, the religion, I think it's helpful to quote James Madison, one of the, our early uh, fathers for this country. He, says, he said, the religion that every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man and it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. This right is, is in its nature an unalienable right. It is unalienable because the opinion of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. A church without a pope. Meaning, as a Protestant nation, we protested Protestantism what grew out of the Protestant Reformation, which were people who were leaving the Roman Catholic Church because they were protesting against the corruption of the church. And one of the corruption of the church was that the Pope stood in the place of God for men. And in the United States, we established the idea, the concept of religious freedom, that every man is, should be allowed to follow their conscience in following God, in worshiping God. I really love the second half of this quote from James Madison. It says, It is unalienable also because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the Creator. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. I think that's an interesting... I, I love that quote because... I think sometimes we have mistaken in this nation, in this country, that the freedom of conscience means to do whatever you want, right? But actually, our early nations, our early father, the fathers of this nation did not understand it that way. They understood it as, it's a, it, it is what? It's an unalienable right, but it's also a duty. It's our unalienable right to worship God as we choose, but it's also our duty to follow our conscience in worshiping God in the way in which he shows us to do. So, yes? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, the lamb. Okay. The symbol of the lamb is the lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet as coming up in 1798. There's a reason why 1798 is used, not 1776, but we'll talk. I'm not going to go over that. <laughs> um, that's not a mistake, I should say. Skipping down says, Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular voice shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted, and every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. The oppressed and downtrodden throughout Christendom have turned to this land with interest and hope. Millions have sought its shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. So here, Ellen White supports what we have been discussing um, in the Great Controversy, page 441. 
But if we continue with Revelation 13, we see that this lamb-like beast, this beast that appears like a lamb, with youth and vigor and innocence and gentleness and a character that appears like that of Christ's, with the two horns of strength, a government that is biblical, a religion and a faith that is biblical, we see that something about it is changes or is wrong. Is, and it is that it begins to speak as a dragon, right? It says, And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down in heaven on earth inside of men, and deceiveth them that, on, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know, I think part of the reason why we don't hear as much of this is because this sounds like we're speaking against the United States. Right? This prophecy is predicting that this United States, which grew up in su with such uh, beautiful principles and such wonderful principles, will one day speak as a dragon and will create and will cause all the world to follow after the first beast, which we believe to be papal Rome, and which, in review further, gains its power from Satan, essentially. As a, as a place of uh, clarification, what does it mean to speak as a dragon? Well, Ellen White tells us, the speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. Okay. So this is predicting that one day, someday, right, someday maybe, the United States will pass laws and pass judgments that will follow all the same things as the first beast. Yeah. All right. And um, So, the, in Revelation 13, 11, and 8, it said what, that this United States will do what? Will tell the world that we should create an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And what does it do? In, so, not only does it tell the world that we have to create an image to the beast, okay, it also gives, had the power to give that image life. So that that image should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast, that the beast should be slain. So what are the three things here that it's doing? It's telling the world to create an image to the beast. It's, it's giving life to that beast. And that life means that it has the ability to do what? To speak and to cause, to do things, right? And we just established that speaking is to create laws and to cause means to enforce those laws, okay? All right, so the image of the beast What is the image of the beast? I'm sorry? 
Sunday. Sunday worship? Is that what the image of the beast is? Is that what we believe as a Baptist? Well, let's talk about the state of things before the Lord comes back. Okay, It says, in Great Controversy, page 444, the Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, there will be, exist a state of religious declension similar to that in the first centuries. What does it predict? In the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Covetous, boasters, <laughs> proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, heavy-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Quoting from 2 Timothy verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. So what is the condition that allows the image of the beast to arise? A state of sinfulness, right? That's a lack of, what does it mean to have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof? It means to have a form of Christianity but denying the power of Christ to actually change us and to create in us a new being, right? So, if we are going to understand what the image of the beast is, Ellen White tells us, then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. So, what she's saying here is, is for us to understand what the image of the beast is, we have to understand how the beast came to be in the first place. And the beast was, the first beast is the papacy. How did the papacy come to be? Is the Roman Catholic papacy, is the, is the, is the papacy a direct descendant of the 12 apostles of Christ? No. Is it the same church? Is it, is it the, is it the, is it the church that followed that, is it the direct descendant of that church, yeah. the apostolic church? Is it? It is. It is. Okay. It's the same, that when Christ left and the 12 disciples and the early apostolic church formed, that eventually became the Roman Catholic Catholic Church. And, and, and here's why, okay? What does Ellen White say? She says, when the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit power of God. The first step to the church uh, the, the first step to the formation of the papacy was that the early church lost what? The simplicity of the gospel. What is the simplicity of the gospel? Okay. That's the second part of it. But the simplicity of the gospel. What is the simplicity of the gospel? That Jesus Christ, that we are sinful human beings that we are lost, and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth to save us from our sins, and he died for us. That is the gospel message. That he died for us, and that he offers us a new life, that he offers to bring us back into the good graces of our God. That is the simplicity of the gospel message. So the Catholic Church started on its road to becoming the Catholic Church by first losing the simplicity of the gospel and then by doing what? Accepting heathen rites and customs. And when she did those two things, she lost the spirit and power of God. So once these two things happened, how did the Catholic Church become, come to be? Once she did these two things, the power that comes with the divine power that comes with God's presence in his church was lost. Okay? And because the Spirit no longer led in the church, 
what did she have to do? She had, in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I want to ask you a question. When you look at our churches, when you look at our Protestant churches all around this nation, do you see the power of God moving in the churches? Do you see God's divine presence leading people to follow their conscience? The power is gone. Right? The script, the power of the spirit is gone out of our churches. In this nation. And that's why when you go to these, these churches, most of them are half empty. There's no power there. And the power that we look for is something that God can give to us alone. But when the churches no longer have the power that God gives to them, what did the papacy do? They went to try to get secular power. They tried to get the civic power to enforce religious laws and morality. If you are not moral because, if, if going to church doesn't provide you with the power to be moral human beings, then we're going to use the state to force you to be moral human beings. That is what led to the formation of the papacy. That is what led to the formation of the first beast. You probably can guess where I'm heading with this now. Okay. The next section in Revelation chapter 13 says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of his beast, of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. All right. I know I have a lot of Seventh-day Adventists in this room. <laughs> What is the mark of the beast? We know what the mark of the beast is, right? Or debit card. Or do we? <laughs> what, what have Seventh-day Adventists traditionally believe the mark of the beast is? A thought or an action? Day of worship. Day of worship, okay. <clears throat> what day of worship do we believe? Sunday. Sunday, right? So the mark of the beast is we believe is somehow related to the Sunday law. You know, I was surprised. If you actually look, this is what we traditionally believe. The change of the Sabbath is a sign or mark of authority of the Romish church. Those who, under, who, understanding the claims of the fourth commandment, choose to observe the false Sabbath in place of the true, are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath, which has been accepted by the world in the place of the day of God's appointment. Ah, there you go. See, Ellen White said it. Mark of the Beast is Sunday. But you know what, actually? It's a little bit more complicated than that. If you look at Great Controversy, page 445.2, she says something really interesting. It says, I'm going to skip down to the bottom. You can read the top if you'd like. It says, The image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will, be, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power to the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. And what's interesting is, is that in this entire chapter, this is Great Controversy, chapter 25, okay? We should look at it later. The entire chapter before this statement, she actually talks about the Sunday law the whole time. So it's not like she didn't know about the Sunday law, or she, it's not like that idea hadn't been present. But what does she say? The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Okay. So if that doesn't confuse you, well, if that does confuse you, here's some more clarification. Councils of Health, Councils on Health, page 520, 
paragraph 3 says, the light that we have upon the third angel's message is the true light. So what is she saying? Yes, it's true. The Sunday law is related to the mark of the beast. Okay? But there's something additional to this. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. What were they proclaiming it to be? The national Sunday law. But what does she also say? But, right? This is what she also says. She says, not all in regard to this matter is yet understood and will not be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. But a most solemn work is to be accomplished in our world. The Lord's command to his servants is, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah 58, 1. What is the unrolling of the scroll? Anybody? Judgment. Okay, in evangelism chapter, or in evangelism, page 19, paragraph 3, says, From town to town, from city to city, from country to country, the warning message is to be pro proclaimed, not with outward display, but in the power of the Spirit by men of faith. And it is necessary that the best kind of labor be given. The time has come, the important time, when, through God's messengers, the scroll is being unrolled to the world. The truth comprised in the first, second, and third angels' messages must go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It must lighten the darkness of every continent and extent to extend to the islands of the sea. There's also imagery. I'm sorry, I'm skipping over a lot. So if you have questions about things that I'm skipping over, or if you want clarification, please talk to me afterwards. In Zechariah chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, there's a, there's a, there is a vision. And I presented this maybe a year or so ago. There's a vision where Zechariah sees a scroll, or a roll, flying across the sky. Right? And what this scroll represented was it says the word of God, okay, the word of God flying across, and 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 so if we take Ellen White's writings and if you take Zachariah's vision, you realize that the scroll is the gospel message, the word of God going to all the world right before Christ's return, okay. And so what is Ellen White telling us is she's telling us that we're not going to fully understand what the mark of the beast is until the events right before Christ's return occur. Does that make sense? Does, does that make sense a little bit? Because now I'm going to get into something else. So she says in great controversy that this should lead, okay, all to a diligent study of the prophecies to learn what the mark of the beast is and how they are to avoid receiving it. How many of you have been doing that? So the mark of the beast, as Adventists, I think we have a little bit of complacency in thinking, oh, we know what it is. We already know what it is. It's the Sunday law. And I just have to be ready so that when the Sunday, National Sunday law comes, I'll just be like, nope, no thank you. And I will avoid getting the mark of the beast. Okay? I'm about to show you something that will hopefully unsettle you some. But before we do that, we're going to finish off Revelation chapter 13. The last section says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. All right. What does that mean? We know this, right? All right. I'm not going to... I'm going to say this though, it says count, and I think that's a really important thing. So one of the things that people have noted in our church, this was uh, Uriah Smith was the one that really did uh, some of the early studies pointing towards this is, the title Vicarious Philae Dei, meaning the vicar of the son, of, or the vicar of God, son of God, okay, has traditionally been a title taken on by the Pope. And what someone realized was that, well, hey, if you take that name and you apply numerical values to the Roman numerals, okay, you add it all up and you get the number 666, right? Vicarious. What is V? You know, kids all know. It stands for five. What is one? It stands for one. C, 100. A and R. Are there any Roman numerals for that? No. So, zero. 
Okay, one and u in the Roman numerals is actually the same as v, so that's five. And you add all these totals up: Vicarious Philidae, day six six six. Hope is the Antichrist. Hope is the you know. There, there's the number. There's the number of the beast. Is that what you guys have come to understand? I would challenge you to do one thing. I would actually challenge you to try to find information proving that this is actually a title that the Pope took on now. It's almost impossible. Okay, the 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 Roman the pap the papacy now disclaims this as ever having been a title. If you look at it, if you try to do the research for it, all you'll find is how the Seventh Day Adventists made this up. Okay. So let's just do a little bit of history because the first place that this title appears is in something very famous. It's called the Donation of Constantine. And it's actually a forged Roman imperial decree supposedly given by Constantine the Great that supposedly transferred authority over to Rome over the western part of the Roman Empire after Constantine's conversion. So the papacy actually used this document, which is a forged document, to claim the authority over that part of the empire. Okay? Interesting thing is, is that the papal church actually accepted this and used this as justification for about 400 years before it was proven to be a fake. Okay? And after that, they kind of pretty much said, yeah, we don't, you know, yeah, we know that's a forgery. That was not real, whatever. But that is actually, it's actually in this document that they first, that, that is first noted the title Vicarious for the Day with reference to the Pope. If you do a lot of the research now, they'll say, see, that was just a forged document. That wasn't really real. Um, actually, the Pope's never took this on. You can't find this anywhere in our stuff. And, and then someone would point out, oh, wait, there is a tiara, a crown that the Pope is supposed to wear that has this title on it. And then you do the research and then, and then they say, oh no, no Pope ever wore that because that was actually the one crown that was given to uh, the Pope by Napoleon and it was too small to fit on anyone's head. Plus no Pope would wear it because it was actually made out of all the broken tiaras of all the of other Popes. So that would, they would never wear that. So I'm only bringing this up because a lot of the fundamental things that we have thought that we've known, or things that we have felt comfortable with, it is becoming very difficult to defend. And it is starting to get very important that you have your resources that you can look at. On the left is the Pope's tiara that people have often pointed to. It's, they, it's hard to ignore that because this image exists all over. But that's the one that Napoleon gave. And so that's how they explain that away. So if you look and look and look, you can't find any information on it, except, thankfully, uh, in their own records. So, so if you look on the, in the papal paper, our Sunday visitor, uh, there's a there's a there's a somebody found this in the Sunday uh, visitor. There's a question that somebody asks. What are the letters supposed to be in the Pope's crown? And what do they signify, if anything? And then they answer, the letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these. Okay. Now, the mitre is a little bit different from the tiara. But it says, Vicarious Philidae, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Now, this is their own response. So they're actually, in 1915, they were claiming this title. Today, they don't. Okay. So it's important for you to look at some of this. Because when you try to mention this to other individuals, they'll say, hey, look, that's... That's totally baloney. Anyway, that's a little bit of a sidetrack. But here's the thing. Vicarious Philidae. Why was that significant? Why does the Bible tell us that Vicarious Philidae is the number of the beast? Is it just because it's this cool numeral, this numerological trick where we can take his title and come up with the number and, ah, oh, there you go, that's the number of the beast? Is that the reason why? 
There may be some significance to the name. I mean, think about the name itself. Vicarious Philidae. Vicar of Christ. Vicar means substitute. Somebody in the place of. Okay? In, that, in essence, the Pope is claiming to be somebody who stands in the place of the Son of God. And that is the definition of the Antichrist, right? Against Christ, or in substitution of Christ. Antichrist. Okay? And that's helping us to identify the characteristic of the beast. Okay? What's also important and interesting to note is that in Revelation 13 it says, Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 660 and 6. Whenever the Bible says to count, what is it actually doing? It's counting the individuals. This is right before. What happens in Revelation 14? Okay, before the three angels' message. 144,000 is introduced in the verses immediately following this one. See, the number of the beast is actually telling you something. It's, it's, this, this meaning is twofold. On the one hand, it is talking about something standing in the place of God. But on the other hand, it's talking about a number, a number of individuals. Uh, it's setting the two sides. Okay? Those who follow the beast, 666. Those who follow Christ, 144,000. Um, Revelation 14.1 follows that. And I did not put the quote in from Ellen White. That shows you how this is. There's only one quote. Look it up. If you look up the one quote for... Um, there's only one quote where she talks about counting the number of the beast. And I'm going to I'm going to tell you this because our early church I, I didn't know this until I started researching this. Our early church actually believed that the 666 was in reference to the number of um, Protestant churches that existed at the time. Just so you know, um, it's in it. I'll just leave it at that. And and you can do the research on that and look into why you know look into why our church believe that. All right, the number six hundred sixty six only appears two other places technically. Technically, it's three, but um, really two other stories in the Bible. Can anyone tell me where the other stories are? I'm sorry? Okay, so some people have pointed to the statue in Daniel as having the dimensions of the number of the beast. Um, but the actual number showing up in the scriptures, 666. Anyone know? Right here. Okay? The first place is with Solomon. Okay? In 1 Kings 10, 14, it says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred and three score and six talents of gold. It's repeated in 2 Chronicles 9.13. It says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and 6 talents of gold. 666. Okay. This doesn't seem related, does it? All right. I've used up so much time, I'm going to rush through the rest. Until you study what Solomon did and why this number is significant for Solomon. Okay. If you have a chance this afternoon, go back and read chapter 4. This is really, really applicable for us in Prophets and Kings. Okay? I've, I've tried to summarize the key points here. Okay? I'll just go ahead and read through this. It says, Prominent among the primary causes that led Solomon into extravagances and oppression, extravagance and oppression, was his failure to maintain and foster the spirit of self-sacrifice. The sharp contrast between the spirit and motives of the people building the wilderness temp tabernacle and the, those engaged in erecting Solomon's temple has a lesson of deep significance. The self-seeking that characterized the workers in the temple finds its counterpart today in the selfishness that rules in the world. The spirit of covetousness, of seeking of the highest position and the highest wage is rife. 
The willing service and joyous self-denial of the tabernacle workers is seldom met with, but this is the only spirit that should actuate the followers of Jesus. I mean, our church has been very blessed that we have leaders in our church who have self-sacrificed for two years now to build our church. And so maybe we can have some understanding of this. Another of the deviations from the right principles that finally led to the downfall of Israel's king was his yielding to the temptation to take to himself the glory that belongs to God alone. Thus it was that the temple of Jehovah came to be known throughout the nations as Solomon's temple. The human agent had taken to himself the glory that belonged to the one higher than the highest. Ecclesiastes 5.8 Even to this day, the temple of which Solomon declared, This house which I have built is called by thy name, is oftenest spoken of, not as the temple of Jehovah, but as Solomon's temple. The missionary spirit that God had implanted in the heart of Solomon and in the hearts of all true Israelites was supplanted by a spirit of commercialism. The opportunities afforded by contact with many nations were used for personal aggrandizement. I don't know. Solomon sought to strengthen his position politically by building fortified cities at the gateways of commerce. Trains, and this is where the gold comes in, trained sailors from Tyre with the servants of Solomon, manned these vessels and voyages to Ophir, and fetched from thence gold and great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. It continues, like Christ, the messengers of the Most High today should take their position in these great thoroughfares, where they can meet the passing multitudes from the parts of the world. Like him, hiding self in God, they are to sow the gospel seed, presenting before others the precious truths of Holy Scripture that will take deep root in mind and heart and spring up into life eternal. That's the first place that this number is represented. The other place is this. This one also seems interesting. Ezra 2, 1 through 13, it says, Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel. Verse 13 says, The children of Adonikam, 660 and 6. These are the only places that that number is explicitly found in the Bible. Okay? And you might think, what does this have to do with this either? Solomon's goal, this. I will just say this. This here, that the children of Adonikam, 666. In Nehemiah, it's 667. What's the difference? The Bible is trying to show us something by metaphor, by analogy, by comparison. Okay? The image to the beast and the number of his name is related to this idea. When Solomon built his temple, okay, the Israelites, if you look at the history of the Israelites, what had happened for the Israelites? They had come out of Egypt, right? They had come out of Egypt. God had blessed their nation through David, and they had enriched nation, the place, the Israel, and put them in a place of great influence, of great power, of great influence. They were a Christian nation. Given the blessings to actually carry out the missionary work of God. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Okay. But what did they do? Instead, they turned all the blessings that God had given them and turned it for self-benefit. They sought selfish gain, commercialism. And they sought to enrich themselves, to raise up their name. And instead of raising up the name of God, they raised up man's name. Is this... You, does that make sense? 
The second story in Ezra and Nehemiah is the same. See, the, the numbers of those people that are coming out, what, what was that number? Of the, what was the history of, of Israel at that point? Israel had just been taken out of Babylon, brought back to the promised land. God, God was to make them a prosperous nation once again, right? But in the end, what did the system turn into by the time Christ showed up? It was a system that benefited individuals, that raised up individuals into position. And in the end, even though they had the exterior of a Christian nation following God, or I shouldn't say Christian, but because Christ was not there yet, but uh, of a, a nation following the true God, they ended up crucifying Christ. That's why this number is used in those two places. And it's giving you an idea as to what is coming in our country. Our nation was raised up in Christian principles. Our nation was blessed by God with riches and wealth and talent beyond anything this world has ever seen before, really. And we were put in a position <coughs> where as a Christian nation, we could truly have that missionary spirit to spread the word of God. But if you look today, if you look at our world today, what is it that it has actually led to? And actually, this really made me think a lot because this is related to the mark of the beast. And I had to consider in myself, have I fallen into this trap? I mean, have I, you know, in my thoughts and in my life, am I just pursuing personal gain or position or any of those things? Because those things are not consistent with the character of God. Those are more consistent with the character of the beast. You know, our duty, it says, in Great Controversy, at the end of Great Controversy, but God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as a standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. And skipping down further, it says, before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord in its support. God wants a people who will follow Scripture as the, as the ultimate authority in their lives. Now, this seems a little out of place, but... Our Seventh-day Adventist Church has been preaching for over 150 years about the mark of the beast, the second coming of Christ, the soon return of Christ, right? So I think a lot of our Adventists, a lot of people in our church, we feel very comfortable that we know what to expect and what to look forward to. And, and that has led some to make some serious and grave errors in their preparation. You know, some, some have taken on the mentality of like a doomsday prepper, preparing you know, to hold out against the end, end times. Right? You know, to see, some have taken the idea that we should flee to the mountains, meaning to Lead to the mountains right now, <laughs> okay, and prepare you know prepare things for ourselves, which is directly against the counsel that we are given. But the point is, is I think most of us think we would recognize the mark of the beast when we see it. We forget what Christ warns us in, in Matthew chapter twenty-four. You know what he repeatedly tells us in Matthew chapter twenty-four. First of all, what is Matthew twenty-four about? Yeah, it's the chapter in which Christ talks about, what, the destruction of Jerusalem, but also at the same time, the second coming of Christ. You know what Christ repeatedly says in Matthew 24? He starts off in verse 4 by saying, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
Verse 5, it says, For many shall come by my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then the next, and verse 11, it says, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And then verse 24, For there shall arise false prophet, or false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. What is something that we should really get out of this chapter? The last times, the end times, is all about deception. And he's saying it's going to be so deceptive that even the very elect might see it and they won't recognize it. We're told to study, right? I mean, what, 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 what is it going to take for us to finally believe, or what is it going to take for us to finally think that it's actually here? <clears throat> is it, do, do, you, do you have to have Congress pass the law before you realize it's here? Do you have to have the soldiers or police knocking down your door before you believe it's here? What is it that's going to require us to believe it? Because you know what? It's already starting to arrive. Okay? So, here are some news headlines. Okay? In Rome, the new Italian government will introduce a ban on Sunday shopping in large commercial centers. Okay? That was in 2012, I think. Yeah. Um, or, no, I'm sorry. Uh, this, uh, this, this is from September 9, 2018. Poland restricted Sunday shopping, returned to Roman Catholic values. And um, there's an article of, uh, I, I'm sorry, I did not reference these very well. It says, many European countries from Germany to France or Austria have implemented partial or total bans on Sunday shopping. Well, last March, a similar legislation proposed by trade union solidarity and support, supported by the Catholic Church and the ruling party Law and Justice was enforced in Poland. The new law bans almost all retailers to open two Sundays a month this year, three per month in 2019, followed by a total ban in 2020. These are taking little steps, and these are commercial things that are happening. In Korea, okay, there's not a huge, strong, thousands of years Catholic tradition there, they have currently large retail outlets such as E-Mart Home Plus and Lotte Mart are subject to restrictions on operating hours following a revision of the Distribution Industry Development Act in 2012 aimed at protecting small shops. Local governments adopted ordinances based on the act forcing large retail outlets to close on the second and fourth Sunday of the month. This was April 14, 2019. We now have the Lord's Day Alliance, the European Sunday Alliance, and the UN. These top, the Lord's Day Alliance is, a, is an alliance in the United States promoting Sunday laws. Okay? The European Sunday Alliance is, is a similar organization in Europe promoting Sunday Alliance or Sunday laws. I think the European Sunday Alliance is a little bit further ahead than the Lord's Day Alliance. And then there's the UN. You know, a lot of what is being promoted in Europe and the United States is based on social justice. The idea of social justice and social, um, social benefit, okay? a return to family values. In places where we don't have a strong Christian value, a lot of it is... Let me just show you. I, I, I can't explain things really well. <laughs> so the UN has something called uh, the United Nations Environmental um, I think it was Initiative, or I, I can't remember the last uh, term for it. And they actually tried something in 1990, and it was only one Earth, United Nations Environmental Sabbath, or Earth Day Rest, Earth Rest Day. You may have heard about some individuals saying that this whole global warming, global warming, carbon initiatives are pointing towards um, Sunday laws. This is why they're saying this. 
okay, is that there is an idea that is circulating and that is being promoted that having a single day, so that, and I didn't put all of these things up here, but there's an idea that we should have 53 days a week, uh, 53 days a year of fit that are set by that are rests for the earth. Right. But in which time they're promoting almost no commercial act, you know, activity and that kind of thing. And, then, and this is being promoted on the base of environmental um, preservation. Okay. Um, so if you remember from the beginning in Revelation 13, the idea of the image of the beast is that the United States has a, is going to create some type of structure that um, represent that is an image of the beast, right? And uh, this is so difficult for me to explain. I, <laughs> I'm just going to read some things. In Forbes 2011, it said, there's a quote in Forbes that says, "The Vatican calls for world government." That isn't just the implication, it's the explicit call in the latest from the Vatican, that we need to move to a system of world government. And then quoted from the Vatican release, these measures ought to be conceived of as some of the first steps in view of a public authority with universal jurisdiction. Guess what? We had this already. Okay? World Government Summit. Have any of you heard of this before? World Government Summit. Well, guess what? Everyone else, all the globalists, they know about the summit, okay? <laughs> this is in Dubai. The most recent was in February 2019. It actually started in 2013. Okay. And what is it? Well, it's the summit that held in strategic collaboration, collaboration with the United Nations, International Monetary Fund, World Health Organization, World Bank Group, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, World Economic Forum, World Trade Organization, yada, 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 okay? That is, if you look at this, that is a one world government. You have a structure to control your money, your health, your economic development, your trade. The UN has something called and all of my slides are all out of order, which is what's throwing me off so much right now. But, uh, the UN has something called SDGs. Have you, are you guys familiar with this? SDGs. These are lots of things for you to look up. Okay? SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Okay? These are very nice sounding um, goals that the UN has established. Um, to try to move our world towards, okay? And you can find them on the U. You just go to the UN website, and these are all the sustainable goals. And it's and it's actually, you know, it sounds really good, right? Uh, goal number. Some of the goals are um, to no poverty. So donate what you don't use. Sounds pretty good. Uh, throw uh, zero hunger. Don't throw away food. Sounds pretty good. Uh, good health and well-being. Vaccinate your family. Protect them and improve public health. If you go down, there's 17 of these goals. And it covers every aspect of life. Every single aspect of life. Okay. Sounds all good and all. Except when you start to realize who's behind all of this. Then there's this, you know, it's so hard to find information on all of these things. But I have, a, I have some counsel for you. If you're looking for something, just go to the Vatican website. They'll tell you everything, okay? <laughs> the Vatican Conference to Study Role of Religious and SDGs. So what's interesting is, is these SDGs are set up as goals. And now, this cardinal in Vatican News, he said, it is about marshalling the moral force of religion behind the implementation of SDG goals. What does that mean? We need to work together, for no, no source of wisdom can be left out, just as no one can be left behind. 
After four years from the adoption of the SDGs, the Ghanaian said we have to realize even more clearly the importance to accelerate and tailor our actions to adequately answer to both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. That is from Ladacha C. I talked about Ladacha C a few months ago. The United Nations, IMF, WHO, World Bank. <coughs> who, who actually told the world that we needed all these things? The United States. Who helped give life to these, these, these things? The United States. They're centered in New York and... Yeah. There's IMF and the World Bank. Oh. Here's the thing about religion, the unity. We, we've talked about interfaith, right? We've talked about interfaith before, which is the coming up together of all religions. All of these things in human wisdom sound really good. And that's the part that's deceptive about it, okay? Here are some headlines, right? Lutherans and Catholics. Chart a path to unit unity in 2016. 2018, Pope Francis calls for unity with Orthodox churches. 2018, Baptist um, Catholic delegations meet to promote Christian unity. And, and then in 2019, February, Pope Francis leading imam signed covenant pushing us toward one world religion. So what do religious leaders think about the Abi du Abu Dhabi interfaith meeting? Well, who addressed it? As Pope Francis addresses the global conference of human fraternity on Monday in the United Arab Emirates, religious leaders participating in the event give their impression of this important interfaith meeting. Who's at the head of this? This is what we're seeing. A woman riding the beast. Okay. And yet we are so blind to it. The nature of what we are looking at. You know, all of this is, it's hidden. If you go to the next, if you go down to Revelation 17, when you see this image of the woman riding the beast, where do you see that? You see it in the wilderness. What does that mean? There's nobody around to see it. This is in secret that it's happening. And then again, in Zechariah chapter 5, the woman is hidden inside of the ephah. They, the angel has to lift the lead lid so that you can see inside and see the evil that's inside. But on the outside, you don't see it. It's done in secret. We are creating a new Babel. I think that's, I think that's why it's called Babylon in the first place. You know, Babylon succeeded Babel. And it's a reference to one thing. We are right here. We are right there. The rest of the world is already starting to see the Sunday law come into place. I mean, if, you're, if you lived in Germany, you would say, the mark of the beast is here, if you're an atheist. <laughs> right? I mean, they have outlawed... Sunday commercialism. They have Sunday laws. If that's what you're looking for for the mark of the beast, do you have to wait till it comes to the United States before you finally believe it's here? <clears throat> you know, our nation has been blessed. And our nation has received the benefits of following biblical Christian principles. Um, but when um, Ellen White tells us that when Boston churches shall unite with the secular craft to sustain a false religion for opposing which their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. <clears throat> Once you see it in the United States, that signals the collapse of our nation. The interesting thing is, is after this, you only see the image of the beast and the beast. Um, you don't see the landlike beast anymore. This is the last place that the landlike beast is, is, is spoken of. Um,
you know, this statement from Revelation 18, verses 4 through 5, is more applicable now than at any other point in history. The loud cry from the powerful angel that came down from heaven was, And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached into heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. <clears throat> We're asleep. The loud cry is about to be announced. Make sure you have oil in your lamps. Make sure you have oil in your lamps. And remember, whatever time you spend with Christ now, in scripture, in prayer, in obtaining the Holy Spirit in your life, that is what is represented by the oil, because we're all asleep. And when we are awakened, it's going to be too late to have the oil, to find the, to go and purchase the oil at that time. Um, I hope... You, re you don't see this as me speaking against the United States. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to present this because this is the time that we're in. Um, and there's a song that I like, which I don't hear very often anymore, but I'd love to sing this as we close. Um, so if you could stand, I'd like to close with prayer and then maybe we could end with the song. Bow our heads for prayer, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive my clumsiness of words, and uh, forgive me if I stood in the way of, of, of um, presenting your message. I just pray that um, the message can be taken away, um, that you, the message that you would have to be heard be heard. And I, I just pray that... Um, you be with our church family, that you bless us um, with a true blessing um, of your presence. Um, that you would give us wisdom and understanding as we study your word. Um, inspire us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to fill our lamps with oil um, and help us um, to take part in that loud cry for the world. Uh, just bless us as we go our separate ways and um, help us to study more on the subject um, and, and, uh, and be with our nation as well. Um, please bless our country um, as we go through such turbulent and such uncertain times. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, God bless us.